Um, so Dr. Ing Simmons, she did her PhD at the MRC London Institute for Medical Sciences. There she worked in the labs of Boris Lenhardt and Matthias Merkenschlager, where she studied the role of cohesin in genome organization and gene, and gene regulation by enhancers. Now, while she was mainly doing computational work during her PhD, she wanted to go back and do some wet lab and also do a new model system. So in 2017, she moved to Germany to join uh, Juanma Baqueriza's lab at the Max Plan Institute of Bio uh, Molecular Biomedicine, where she now works on genome organization during Drosophila embryonic development. So we're pretty excited about hearing what research you've been up to. So please go ahead. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to be part of this really excellent um, seminar series. So as Melvin said, I'm interested in how genes are regulated and how the genome is organized. And I'm going to be talking about this in the context of Drosophila embryonic development. So we all have about two meters of DNA in most of our cells. And this has to fit inside a nucleus, which is only a few microns across. And this packaging has to happen in a way that allows the right genes to be accessed and activated at the right times. The way the genome is organized is crucial for this uh, gene expression to happen in the right places and right times. Disrupting this organization can lead to developmental disorders and cancer. Historically, genome organization has mainly been studied by imaging approaches such as FISH, uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization, and that's what I'm showing here. Each chromosome is labeled in a different color and occupies a distinct chromosome territory. However, these imaging approaches have limited resolution. So the method that we use to look at this is high c Many of you are probably familiar with this method, but I'm gonna briefly explain it just so that we're all on the same page. So first, um, to capture the organization of the chromatin inside the nucleus, we cross-link cells with formaldehyde so that regions of the genome that are in close proximity inside the nucleus are cross-linked together. We then digest the genome with a restriction enzyme, fill in overhangs left by this restriction enzyme, and uh, mark them with a biotinylated nucleotide. Then we ligate together free ends of DNA to create chimeric pieces of DNA which come from different regions of the genome, which were in close 3D proximity in the original cell. We fragment the DNA and select these biotinylated chimeric fragments that we're interested in and sequence them using paired end reads. We then map the paired end reads back onto the genome. So for example, here, one read would come from this green region and one from this orange region of the genome. We do this for hundreds of millions of reads and count the number of reads which support each interaction between each possible pair of regions. And then we transform these counts into a color scale to enable us to visualize this genome wide. That looks something like this. This is high C from Drosophila and I'm showing here the whole genome. I've labeled each chromosome or, or chromosome arm and you can see that there's structure here. So I particularly, I particularly want to point out that each chromosome has more interactions uh, within itself than with other chromosomes. These are the chromosome territories that I mentioned earlier. If we zoom in uh, to a single chromosome arm, then we can see that there's additional structure at a smaller scale. So this kind of alternating plaid-like pattern represents interactions of active regions of the genome with other active regions and inactive with inactive regions called compartmentalization. If we zoom in even further closer to the diagonal, then we can see that there are, there's additional structure. Um, so for example, these regions with high self interactions that are relatively insulated from interactions with their neighboring regions. And these are called topologically associating domains or contact domains. Since this interaction matrix is symmetric, we usually only show half of it like so. And this is the view that I'm going to be showing most often in this talk. So I said earlier that we're interested in studying this, uh, this organization during embryonic development. And there's two reasons for that. Firstly, because this is a complex and crucial epigenetic transition from specialized gametes to a totipotent zygote, and then to a complex embryo that has many different cell types. This is all initially driven by maternally provided mRNAs and proteins. And the zygotic genome is only activated later in development. This happens not just in Drosophila, but in other species, including humans. And the second reason we study development is because it's really beautiful. So in this video, you're seeing a developing Drosophila embryo about one hour post fertilization. We've labeled the nuclei with GFP so that you can see each nuclear division as it happens. At this stage, the embryo doesn't have individual cells and the nuclei divide about every 10 to 15 minutes. 
What you see coming up on the right is 3D genome maps that we have produced for different nuclear cycles using HiC. After about two and a half hours of development, the embryo reaches nuclear cycle 14, where the division cycle slows, the embryo becomes cellularized, and the zygotic genome begins to express thousands of genes. These genes drive future development and gastrulation, which is what you're seeing now. So even if you haven't looked at HiC data very much, um, you can see that there's big differences here between the structure at nuclear cycle 12 and at nuclear cycle 14 or three to four hours of development during this really rapid transition and zygotic genome activation. What uh, the lab showed previously in 2017 is that at nuclear cycle 12, before widespread zygotic genome activation, the genome is mostly unstructured with only a few domain boundaries, such as the, the one shown here, which are associated with early expressed genes. After zygotic genome activation, boundaries, domains, and compartments form genome-wide. Although there's a clear association between transcription and boundary formation, the lab found that loss of transcription, inhibition of transcription, weakened boundaries rather than these boundaries being completely lost. In contrast, a subset of boundaries were found to be completely dependent on a transcription factor called Zelda. Zelda is a pioneer factor, which is essential for proper zygotic genome activation and uh, normal embryonic development in Drosophila. And uh, when you knock out Zelda, you get fusion of, uh, of, of some domains, so the purple domain and the green domain here that would usually be separated by a boundary that has Zelda binding. So this, le this leads us to some questions which were still unresolved. We know that by nuclear cycle 14, due to patterning by maternally provided signals and proteins, many cell and tissue types within the embryo are already specified and genes are expressed in specific patterns like uh, the ones shown here. So given that gene expression is already heterogeneous across the embryo, how heterogeneous is the genome organization? And do gene regulatory processes affect this organization? So for example, do transcription factors other than Zelda have the ability to affect domain organization? To address these questions, I'm using the dorsal ventral patterning of the embryo as a model system. This is controlled by a gradient of a transcription factor called dorsal. And this video shows the establishment of that gradient. So this is showing a cross section through the embryo um, with histone shown in magenta and the dorsal transcription factor in green. Due to maternally provided signals, high levels of dorsal enter the nucleus on the ventral side of the embryo here, and then intermediate levels further, further up the embryo, and on the dorsal side of the embryo, this transcription factor is excluded from the nucleus. So this gradient of dorsal concentration leads to the specification of different tissues depending on the concentration. Um, dorsal ectoderm at low levels, neural ectoderm at intermediate levels, and mesoderm at high levels. One of the great things about working with Drosophila is that there's lots of genetic tools available for, it, for us to use. Um, and these include fly lines, which have maternal effect mutations, which lead to embryos that have uniform levels of dorsal across the embryo. So either zero intermediate levels or high levels of dorsal across the whole embryo, which leads to embryos which produce only a single one of these tissues. These mutant lines are a really great tool because they allow us to use genomic techniques on whole embryos to investigate the differences between these different tissues. So in collaboration with the Manovic Lab in Stockholm, I'm using this system to investigate tissue-specific genome organization and its relationship to gene regulation. We first wanted to identify tissue-specific enhancers and the genes that they regulate. So we carried out differential HTK27 acetylation analysis using a mixture of published ChIP-seq data and new data from the Manovic Lab. And using this, we identified enhancers which were specifically acetylated in each, in each of the tissues. So here I'm showing a set of regions which have um, high HDK27 acetylation, specifically in GD7 mutant embryos, which represent dorsal ectoderm. And you can see they have much lower signal in the other two types of mutant embryos. And in comparison to these, we also identified a set of enhancers which are specifically active in TOL RM9 and RM10 mutant embryos, so in neuroleptoderm, and the set of enhancers which are active in mesoderm. We also identified, wanted to identify genes that are associated with these enhancers and check whether they have higher expression in the tissues where the enhancers are active. So that's what I'm showing here on the right. And if you just focus on the top uh, plot for now, 
This is showing genes associated with enhancers which are active in dorsal ectoderm. And you can see that they have higher expression in dorsal ectoderm than in the other two tissues. The same is true for the other two sets of enhancers we identified. Here I'm showing an example of a gene which is highly expressed in TOL10B in mesoderm, but not expressed in dorsal ectoderm or neuroectoderm. Um, so I'm showing uh, pol 2 pol 2 chip seq data from wild type embryos here, and then RNA seq data from the three different mutants. And you can see that this gene is expressed in, in TOL 10B in mesoderm and not at all expressed in the other two tissues. Along with this, it also has higher H2K27 acetylation uh, in, in mesoderm, and we identified tissue specific enhancers in this region. What I want to point out here is that this gene and its enhancers are um, all located inside this single defined uh, topological domain, which is also larger and more structured than the neighboring region hit that's here highlighted in orange, which contains several housekeeping genes. We found that this was generally the case genome-wide. Domains containing dorsal ventral enhancers are larger than other domains, and they're also less gene dense. This is in line with previous results from multiple labs which suggests that developmental genes are often found in large and gene poor domains. So we've shown that these mutant embryos have different chromatin states and different gene expression, but we additionally wondered how heterogeneous that gene expression might be across the mutant embryos. Although they only produce one tissue along the dorsal ventral axis, there are other patterning mechanisms that are still active in these embryos, like the anterior posterior patterning that's shown here. So to investigate expression heterogeneity, we performed single cell RNA sequencing. Looking at control embryos, we identified 15 distinct cell populations that express different combinations of marker genes. Some of these are clearly related to the dorsal ventral patterning of the embryo. So there's three ectoderm clusters of cells here and these two mesoderm clusters here, while others we would expect to be unaffected in the mutants. So for example, the pole cells, which are the future germ cells of the embryo. Next, we looked at these clusters in mutant embryos. So I'm showing here again the control embryo data for reference, and I'm highlighting the ectoderm, mesoderm, and neural populations. If we look in the mutant embryos, so first the GD7 mutant embryos, which represent dorsal ectoderm, here you can see that the mesoderm cluster is almost completely missing, and the neural cluster is severely depleted. In the embryos which represent neural ectoderm, the mesoderm cluster is again missing, and in embryos which represent mesoderm, while this mesoderm cluster is clearly present, the ectoderm clusters are severely depleted. Uh, some clusters are indeed present in all three mutants, like the pole cells, which are here on the right-hand side of these plots. To validate the identities of these clusters further, we also looked at the expression of the genes which are associated with the dorsal ventral enhancers that we had identified previously. So in, this, in these plots, I'm showing genes which are associated with a dorsal ectoderm enhancers. So I'm showing expression of genes which are associated with dorsal ectoderm enhancers. Um, so you can see that these genes are expressed in this population of cells and in this population of cells, in contrast to genes which have neuroectoderm enhancers, which are more expressed in this population of cells. If we compare these plots with the mutant data above, we can see that these correspond to the populations of cells which are depleted in the mutants. So um, cells that have high expression of genes which have uh, enhancers in dorsal ectoderm, these are actually depleted in the neuroectoderm mutant single cell RNA-seq data, and vice versa, cells which have high expression of genes with neuroectoderm enhancers, these are missing in the dorsal ectoderm embryos. So, so far I've shown you that these different tissues have different chromatin state and different enhancer usage, and also different gene expression patterns. But back to the key question, do they have different 3D genome organization? In order to address this, we carried out high c in the different mutant embryos. Um, so here I'm showing an example of a region that has several genes which are expressed specifically in dorsal ectoderm in GD7 mutant embryos. Um, so you can see expression of these genes so they're, they're highlighted by asterisks here, and there's RNA-seq showing their expression here. And they also have enhancers, which are specifically active in this tissue. 
You can see that as before, these genes and their enhancers fall inside a single defined contact domain. If I bring up the data for the other two tissues now, um, you should be able to see here that there's very little RNA-seq or HUK27 acetylation signal in this region in these other tissues. And it, but if we then compare the high c data, you can see that the structure is the same. So interestingly, even though we know that the onset of expression of housekeeping genes is associated with the formation of, of domain boundaries, expression of these tissue-specific genes doesn't seem to have an effect on the domain structure. In the interest of time, I'm just going to show you one example now, but we looked at this genome-wide at a number of different developmentally regulated dorsal ventral patterning genes, and we found the same thing at all of them. In fact, rather than just visually inspecting the chromatin conformation at developmentally regulated genes, we also wanted to quantify changes in genome organization. So to do this, I used a new tool from the lab, which uses computer vision techniques to quantitatively compare HiC data. The way that this works is kind of similar to how Facebook or Google Photos might recognize the face of your friend in a photo that you took. You take a reference image, in our case, this is a high C matrix, and compare this to a series of different query images and calculate a score for how similar these images are. So this is the SSIM score or similarity score. Um, so in this case, this high C matrix has a higher similarity in, it, in its structure to the reference region here compared to these regions here, which have a lower similarity score. I use this method to compare control high C data with high C from each of the mutants and to calculate similarity scores in windows across the whole genome. Uh, what I'm showing here is the scores for windows with and without genes which are differentially expressed between the mutants. So uh, windows that have genes which are differentially expressed during dorsal ventral patterning are shown in gray and windows without differentially expressed genes are shown in white. Uh, what you need to know to understand this plot is that scores around zero show that the genome organization is similar between control and mutant, while negative scores represent regions that have significant differences in their organization, in their chromatin structure. We found that overall, there are no significant differences in the similarity scores between regions with and without differentially expressed genes. And this was the case when looking at any of these three um, mutant embryos. This confirms that genome-wide, there's no association between differential gene expression and changes in genome organization. So in conclusion, we've shown using a genetic system of embryonic development that while different tissues have different gene expression and chromatin state, the 3D organization of the chromatin is the same, even at differentially expressed genes. This suggests that 3D organization and gene regulation are independent. So gene expression and chromatin state don't drive chromatin organization in this system, and, this, and differential organization isn't required for differential gene expression either. We propose that instead the organization of, developmental, of developmentally regulated genes and enhancers inside domains provides a kind of a framework or a scaffold which allows these genes to be activated and regulated by, by their enhancers in the right place at the right time. Um, if you'd like more details about our study, we have a preprint that's available on BioArchive at this link, and I'm happy to take questions, but first I want to acknowledge a few people. Um, so first of all, our collaborators from Stockholm University who did the ChIP-seq experiments and provided all of the mutant embryos for this project. Uh, Juanma and everyone in the Back Rizos Lab for all of their support and feedback. And I was funded by the Humboldt Foundation and the Max Planck Society. And thank you. All right, all right. Um, thank you very much, Liz, for a very clear, very beautiful talk. Uh, so let me just remind people in the audience that if you have questions, you can either raise your hand and I'm gonna give you the power to speak and ask it live, or you can simply just type your questions in the Q&A chat box and I can just read it back. So, okay, so while people are doing that, um, Liz, one quick question. So going back here in your model where it says chromatin organization and the gene regulation independent, in your different mutants, were you able to look also at the POL2 distribution? Does that change? Yeah, that's a great question. We don't actually have that data at the moment. We have um, RNA-seq and K27 acetylation data, but not POL2 chip-seq for these different mutants. It would definitely be interesting to see whether that is different or similar across the mutants. And that would, I think that would help us understand the mechanism a bit, a bit, a bit more. 
Right, because the RNA seq, I mean, you're not doing nascent expression, right? You're just looking at the steady le levels of mRNA. Is that correct? Yes, this is this is steady state mRNA rather rather than nascent transcription. This is something that um, we are considering looking at for future studies. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, gross, gross seq data, for example. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, so perhaps you will be able to see some differences with the nascent expression. All right. So I'll start reading one of the questions in the. In the Q&A, uh, so Peter Sarkis is asked, in the example of enhancer activation in the toll mutant, it appears as though there's more RNA signal at the five prime end of the gene. Might this indicate recruitment and pausing at this gene rather than full transcription? Um, I am not sure that I know exactly what is which which example is being referred to here? Um, uh, Peter, I mean, if you're in the audience, would you like to ask your question directly? But yeah, otherwise, to... oops. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it was, it was one of the earlier slides. Um, it is true that there, there may be differences in in the the pol recruitment and pausing between the tissues, or uh, it may be that pol recruitment is the same in all of the tissues and expression is regulated at the level of, of pausing or elongation. Um, but I think the, the key finding here, which was really intriguing to me, is that it doesn't seem that these, that these genes need differential organization or differential enhanced promoter interactions in order to be expressed correctly. Right, okay. So I think that was the right question. Um, so let me see, there's one question from Olivier Messina saying, very nice talk. In the ChIP-seq data, you show that the H3K27 trimet is both present in dorsal and ventral part of the embryo. Is the H3K27 trimet profile then dependent or independent of transcription? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we find that uh, there is a slight reduction of HDK27 trimethylation around active genes, um, which I didn't really have time to show you here. So it is it is reduced in the regions where in the regions of the embryo where these genes are active. Um, so I don't know. It, I, 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 we don't really have the data to definitively answer your question. Um, I do want to maybe also say that although the examples I show here have relatively high levels of H3K27 trimethylation in these, in these domains, um, we've also looked at domains which don't have any high levels or, or broad enrichment of H3K27 trimethylation and found the same thing in those cases. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so. Shreyasi Mukherjee, she's asking, um, do these mutant embryos still interact similarly with the AP signaling cues, or do you think that that would change chromatin conformation profiles between the mutants? Um, as far as I'm aware, they do have relatively normal anterior-posterior patterning um, in the sense that they all form germ cells and seem to form some kind of some kind of head structures. They look pretty, so these embryos survive to the point of gastrulation and actually afterwards as well, but they look, they don't look normal at all after gastrulation. So it's a little bit hard to, to say. Um, it's an interesting question whether anterior posterior patterning might affect chromatin conformation and dorsal ventral patterning not. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I would suspect from what we've looked at that, that there wouldn't be differences between anterior and posterior regions of the embryo either. Actually, um, there's been a paper from Michael Eisen's lab, which did look at uh, just the anterior half and the posterior half of the embryo and found that their chromatin organization was the same. Um, and that was really nice. What we have here is a little bit more kind of tissue specific resolution rather than just uh, the, the front half and the back half of the embryo. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, Liz. 